Hi. Hi. Uh, Tom Riley is my name. I'm from Drogheda in Ireland. And um, I'm here to talk to you about Oliver Cromwell, the guy in the background there. Um, I've written a few books about him. And um, I am basically a defender of his, which is really strange because I'm from Drogheda as well. And Drogheda is one of the towns where Cromwell is supposed to have uh, killed um, civilians, massacred inhabitants, slaughtered townspeople um, throughout the town in 1649. Upwards on about 3,000 uh, people, including soldiers, are alleged to have been killed. Um, I believe that Cromwell was fundamentally a good man, which is really um, very unusual for somebody from Drogheda. Uh, but that's what I believe because I've done the research and I have come up with these conclusions. I'm very Irish. There's my um, reversed um, Ireland uh, insignia. Um, sing the national anthem, know the words, speak reasonable Irish. Um, very patriotic. Uh, love my country. But I do believe that this is a historical miscarriage of justice. And I believe that Cromwell has been um, um, much maligned, that his reputation is not deserved and that uh, he didn't do the kind of things that uh, people said he did. He wasn't a genocidal maniac and he wasn't a monster. He was fundamentally OK. Uh, so that's the, the major statement out of the way. I'm um, just going to cut to the chase and talk about um, just quickly, the books that I've written, these are going to come up in reverse because this camera is in reverse. That's Cromwell at Drogheda by me, Tom Riley, 1993. That's Cromwell, An Honourable Enemy by me, 1999. This, I think, was 2001. It's also Cromwell, An Honourable Enemy, and it's a different version of it. This is a third version of Cromwell, An Honourable Enemy, and I have no idea what year that came out. Then I went for a while with nothing and then in 2014 I brought out Cromwell was framed in the same hilarious way that Cromwell an Honourable Enemy is a title that raises the hackles. And then um, for some time I wanted to get some academics involved because I'm just a, um, an amateur historian. Uh, I'm not uh, an academic nor have I qualified uh, I haven't gone through college. I'm just basically cynical. I'm from Drogheda, as I say, and that's one of the things that made me think, well, what the hell happened here? Why was all of my ancestors killed and why did Cromwell come to my town? Anyway, for years, I've been trying to get some academics to come on board and to produce a book that was uh, a revisit, a relook at uh, Cromwell in Ireland because I firmly, um, you know, passionately believe that this should happen. It did, it culminated in, that reads, Cromwell and Ireland, New Perspectives. That's what that says. Um, my name is, isn't on the front, but it was my idea. I conceived of it and um, I inveigled uh, 11 academics to write essays for it. Um, I also include my own in there as well. Uh, it's published by Liverpool University Press and it's 90 quid sterling, which is mad because that's uh, typical academic um, book prices. Didn't expect it to be like that. Um, anyway, the latest offering is, that says in reverse, The Protector, The Fall and Rise of Oliver Cromwell. And this is mine. And this is the same message, but a different audience, because it's a novel. And it's a novel of Cromwell's life. Not that I'm obsessed or anything. <laughs> I just believe that I'm doing the right thing. And I think that what I'm doing um, is honourable. And uh, that it's basically my contribution to the Good Friday Agreement. Um, because Cromwell has been used um, on numerous occasions um, to justify atrocities in the North. Um, he's also um, been used uh, on a daily basis to foster anti-English sentiment because we hold a huge grudge um, over uh, what the English did to us. And Cromwell was the one who uh, basically f uh, subjugated Ireland uh, before uh, anybody, anybody else did. He was the one English leader who succeeded in um, taking over the whole country. And uh, we hold that grudge and it fits that narrative of us being the victims of um, English oppression. Uh, and that's fine. I'm perfectly happy to be a victim of English oppression, but just not uh, w with regard to uh, facts and nonsense that's made up and not true. 
Um, we were taught this kind of stuff back in uh, when we went through our schooling, the educational system of the 60s, that was mine. Um, and we were given um, essentially what um, De Valera's Ireland wanted us to learn. Um, they wanted to fill us with, um, it seems, uh, anti-English um, propaganda is all I can really call it. And that's what happened. And even today, still today, um, in schools, and I'm just going to prove that, I look away now just to read this out because I don't know this off my heart. What's him, by the way, in the background? You can see him, him and his round heads actually breaking into Drogheda. Anyway, um, there are two school books currently that I just quote um, usually about this. Uh, they're current. They're on the curriculum for, for children, primary school children. And this is what it says. And there's no ambiguity here. Um, the first one says, and it's uh, a book published by Folans, um, Earthlink it's called, and uh, fifth class. And it says, um, Cromwell captured Drogheda. About 3,000 men, women and children were killed. And that's, um, you know, fairly clear. That's okay, you know. So in terms of uh, informing children these days what happened in Drogheda, uh, erroneously, mind you, because it's total nonsense. Um, and the Educational Company of Ireland released uh, a book called Timeline, and that's still, uh, I believe, on the curriculum. Even if it's not, it still um, has been available for children since 2008. And that reads, uh, He, Cromwell, first laid siege to Drogheda, he was determined to make an example of the town, and when he captured it, he slaughtered the entire population. Uh, I get that a lot, and um, as, a, as a Cromwell apologist from Drogheda, um, being a unique animal, um, I find myself defending uh, these words that children are still being taught. So I think it's dangerous, um, I don't think it's right, and I think my, my thesis, my theory, and these facts that I espouse will eventually filter through to become uh, the popular in, in, into popular history. Uh, why does it matter? Uh, it basically matters because, as I say, um, English anti-English sentiment is fostered by this, uh, and I don't believe that's uh, in any way right. Um, and it's a good story, of course. Um, so if you take, how do we know? What's, what's the reason behind us arriving at this particular um, tradition? What's the verdict of history? The verdict of history is that Cromwell was a monster that he killed um, mercilessly um, defensive um, men, women and children in Drogheda and in Wexford. Um, so how, what's the evidence for that? Um, obviously it's almost overwhelming, um, but not to the point where I can't discount every single shred of it with facts. Um, and this is effectively it. So. Obviously, generations of historians and academics have gone through this and they essentially agree, um, which is really, <laughs> really very bizarre. Uh, it seems to be a period in history that has been put to bed. Um, but anyway, since my first book in 1999, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it obviously caused quite a stir and people are beginning to look at the period. Obviously, the historians closed ranks when this pugnacious amateur came out and 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 um, claimed that they have been wrong all this time uh, and they have um, and uh, but others naturally uh, didn't close ranks and a lot of historians agree with me of course um, because it's very hard to to argue with facts you can argue with speculation and tradition um, so it's the verdict of history um, Cromwell hated Catholics that's what everybody uh, understands uh, Cromwell's religious um, stance to be. Uh, he said himself that he killed many inhabitants. I'm just putting the arguments as to how we feel, how we know, how we all are taught um, the traditional viewpoint. Um, he said at the end of a letter that he wrote back to Parliament um, after Drogheda, he said um, that he killed many inhabitants. Um, there is uh, lots of accounts, or there are lots of accounts. One is, in particular is from a, a, an unnamed officer in the regiment of Sir John Clotworthy, and he says uh, he was a, a parliamentarian at one point in time, and he says that, that at Drogheda no quarter was given uh, for 24 hours to man, woman and child, so as that not a dozen escaped out of the town of townspeople or soldiers. Again, that's from, well, that's from 1685, not too long after the events, and um, seems pretty categoric. Uh, a dozen. Uh, he's he's saying there's an account of a guy called Thomas A. Wood 
Thomas A. Wood um, was uh, a soldier uh, in the Parliamentarian Army, in Cromwell's Army, and he uh, came to Drogheda and fought for Cromwell here. He's actually buried in Drogheda, believe it or not, um, but uh, he didn't die in the conflict. He settled here afterwards. Um, and then in 1660, the Irish Catholic clergy uh, decided to say that 4,000 civilians had died at Drogheda. Again, 1660, quite close to the events. Um, so how can you possibly argue with that? This is the Catholic clergy. Um, paragons of virtue, he says sarcastically. Um, Thomas Wood. So Thomas Wood, uh, his account is very important because his is the only eyewitness um, account that gives us details of civilian deaths. And they are these. I'm just about to read, read them out because this is uh, his brother writing uh, his, uh, his, in his memoirs. He talks about Thomas and he said he would tell them of the most terrible assaulting and storming of Trader, that's Drogheda, wherein he himself had been engaged. He told them that 3,000 at least, besides some women and children, were, after the assailants had taken part and afterwards, all the town put to the sword on the 11th and 12th of September 1649, at which time Sir Arthur Aston, the governor, had his brains beat out and his body hacked and chopped to pieces. He told them... That when they were to make about to, to make their way up to the lofts and galleries in the church and up to the tower where the enemy had fled, each of the assailants would take up a child and use it as a buckler of defence, a shield in other words, when they ascended the steps to keep themselves from being shot or brained. And after they had killed all in the church, they went into the vaults underneath where all the flower and choicest of the women had hid themselves. One of these, a most handsome virgin, and arrayed in costly and gorgeous apparel, kneeled down to Thomas Wood with tears and prayers to save her life, and being struck with a profound pity, took her under his arm, went with her out of the church with intention to put her over the works and to let her shift for herself. Uh, but then a soldier, perceiving his intentions, ran his sword through her belly or fundament, whereupon Mr Wood, seeing her gasping, took away her money, jewels, etc., and flung her down over the works." So Mr. Wood, um, you know, wasn't such a noble gentleman in the end. Um, but that's the, the account of Thomas Wood. And how do you argue with that? Well, I will, if you stick with this. Um, there were also a couple of newspapers at the time in 1649 uh, that came out and made the same allegations. And this is a newspaper called Mercurius Elencticus. And it was written by a guy called George Wharton. And the offending uh, paragraph reads thus, that the Cromwellians of Drogheda possessed themselves of the town and used all cruelties imaginable on the besieged, as well inhabitants and others, sparing neither women nor children. This is 1649. It's a newspaper from then. Uh, another newspaper from then, uh, The Man in the Moon. The Man in the Moon was written by a guy called John Crouch. We know who the writers were. We, 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 um, there's a lot of detail. A lot of historians have done print media in the 17th century. And um, it's not something that's, um, it's not that long ago uh, in terms of history and antiquity. So there's a lot of information out there. Um, he says, The Man in the Moon, their barbarous cruelty in that abhorred act not to be paralleled by any of the former massacres of the Irish sparing neither women nor children but putting them all to the sword three thousand indeed they killed but two thousand were women and children and divers aged persons that were not able to support themselves much less unable to resist them the town thus gained with the loss of five thousand of their own just that last expression five thousand of their own is referring to the parliamentarian army and that's absolute codswallop um, because they were not uh, the official accounts uh, tell us that not even about a hundred maybe uh, of uh, the Cromwellian soldiers lost their lives at Drogheda because a massacre took place um, there wasn't a battle it was simply a massacre um, so straight away that particular account is called into question on that uh, point alone but we'll come back to that um, so even the historians that are around today the historians that are experts in this period not just you know historians who cover uh, wide periods in Irish history. This is, uh, let's say, uh, the example, for instance, of Professor Michal O'Shukru. Michal O'Shukru um, uses um, Mercurius Elencticus and the Man in the Moon uh, to support um, his allegations that uh, the civilian population, or at least some of the civilians, uh, in fact, he, he uses the expression, 
an indeterminate number of civilians. Now I'm using this word a lot and it will keep coming up because this is absolutely key. I keep saying the word civilians. I'm not dis discriminating between uh, uh, military or uh, civilian. I'm saying civilians because that's what the historians say. These are the words they use. Uh, Jason McGilligan was another one. Jason McGilligan says that all the evidence suggests that Cromwell slaughtered the garrison and many of the townspeople of Drogheda in September 1649. Um, inflammatory, uh, if you want to consider the fact that the implication is that the townspeople were killed. It doesn't mention in what context, whether they were armed, whether they were just slaughtered in their houses, whether they were women or children or whatever. He just says townspeople. Um, John Mowell, who is the uh, most, the, the foremost Cromwell expert probably in the world, does some number juggling, and I've just quote. I'm just going to quote from him. He mentions a guy called Hugh Peter, who was Cromwell's chaplain, uh, and he says, "This is Mowell speaking now." Hugh Peter, close to Cromwell and on his council of war, suggested that the total number killed was three thousand five hundred and fifty-two. Very specific, and he gives the number of military survivors as four hundred. Cromwell thinks that there were 2,782 killed, um, apart from the many inhabitants. Now, the implication of both Cromwell and Peter is that about seven to 800 civilians died. And this is uh, moral talking, uh, <clears throat> and I see no reason to doubt that figure. Well, I see lots of reasons to doubt that figure, um, and I will uh, el allude to them as we go on. Um, firstly, and uh, I'm just giving you the, 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 the symmetry there, the, the similarity between all of the statements there is townspeople, civilians, and moral again say civilians. Now it's shocking that, uh, that uh, historians in this day and age of such repute continue to use those sort of expressions, uh, general expressions that use the word civilians and don't discriminate between those who are armed and those who are unarmed, uh, because that's kind of key. Because if you talk about those who are unarmed, what are we saying? You know, we're saying that they were slaughtered um, be as ind indiscriminately as civilians who weren't involved in the conflict. Um, and then just finally, there's a Professor Podrick Lenehan, uh, who is in NUI Galway. And he, in an exchange of letters in the Drogheda Independence some, some years ago, not that long ago, uh, said, uh, so innocent civilians were killed. Having said that, it is dangerous to speculate. Then he speculates. I would tend to suggest about a thousand civilians fatalities. Okay, so now again, civilian fatalities. No discri d d discrimination between what what would would they have been, because let's just discuss what's a civilian. What are we talking about here? Um, are we talking about um, unarmed, defenseless, ordinary aunties, uncles, granddads, grannies, teenagers, toddlers, babies? They're civilians, okay? They're not soldiers. They're not in the military. They didn't join up. They weren't, uh, they didn't have swords or pistols or pikes um, or rifles, or they weren't standing behind a cannon. Um, and all these civilians, uh, and I'm just discriminating there between civilians and the, and the military, uh, would have had jobs. They would have been brewers, innkeepers, lawyers, seamstresses, Carpenters, cobblers, school children, um, domestic servants, stonemasons, butchers, chimney sweeps, apprentices. They would have been so many things. They weren't soldiers because they didn't join up. I'm just talking about, in general, people who weren't in the military and who lived in this town, my town, that I love so passionately. So they're non-military people. The difference, uh, to, is, which, which is perfect to, <laughs> to um, use as an, as an example, is today, I'm not, a, I'm not a soldier, I never joined up, and there are those who, who have done and are, and they're very clearly soldiers. So it's exactly the same sort of stark difference today between uh, what, historic, what um, so soldiers were and what civilians were. So I just want to make that clear. I also want to make clear, because I've just explained that all the historians who um, who say that Cromwell killed civilians, just use that word. They just use that word civilians. If you put a, a, a weapon into a civilian's hand, that civilian is no longer a civilian. And that happened a lot uh, during the, the mid-17th century, where if to, to, in order to defend either their property or their town or their city or whatever it was, 
um, townspeople took up arms, but now they're suddenly not civilians anymore. You know, I just need to get that point across. So Drogheda, pre-1649, what was it like? What's, what was the story? Most um, people who come to the subject think it's an English army coming over to Ireland and they're encountering an Irish town and they're going to take that Irish town. Ergo, there's going to be trouble. But Drogheda wasn't a quintessential Irish town. Drogheda was within the Pale. That's the English part of Ireland. The Anglo-Normans founded the town in the 1100s. Um, they always looked to London, as did Dublin, for um, uh, their administration for direction. Uh, was chiefly Protestant uh, in, in makeup. Um, there were parliaments held in Drogheda like there were parliaments held in Dublin. So Poynings Law was passed in 1492 in Drogheda, down in the Bull Ring, uh, Ollie's Pub, if you're interested, and from the town. That's where the, the site would have been. Um, but in 1649, it also would have had divided loyalties. There's no reason to think that Drogheda was any different to any other town on these islands. I know that rankles with some people because um, these islands, we have nothing to do. <laughs> we are separate from the UK. Um, but in those days, let's just say the two islands, as there are today, um, but in the English towns, because an English civil war took place, there were divided, divided loyalties. And the divided loyalties were either royalist or parliamentary, and you were either for the king or you were for parliament, because there was stuff going on over there that gave us the opportunity to rebel over here. England's difficulty, Ireland's opportunity. So rather than speculate about the civilian population uh, of Drogheda and, and, you know, think about, um, you know, make up sort of images in your head where you think English army coming over to an Irish town, going into Irish houses, taking out civilians, killing them and so on, because that's all in people's heads. Um, but if you if you actually look at the facts and look at what we know about the civilian population in Drogheda, we do know that there were approximately 3,000 people living here. So that's some information. We also know that uh, there was, uh, so you had the 1641 siege. There was a siege here in 1641 in Drogheda. That lasted for five months. It was orchestrated by the Irish rebellion. Um, Phelan O'Neill took the lead in that. He uh, purported to um, have the king's permission, uh, the king's blessing for this rebellion. It turned out that it wasn't the case um, at all. Uh, Charles I never gave, gave uh, him any permission or approval for it. Um, but it's, despite that, for you know, after years of an, an, <laughs> you know, uh, of religious oppression and um, constant, uh, you know, it, 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 taking of the land, um, the Irish rebelled, and that's totally understandable. However, they committed atrocities and they killed Protestants in cold blood. This is the thing. There were there were things going on on both sides. Um, but Drogheda was besieged by the Irish because it was essentially an, an English town. Yes, there would have been Irish people living in it, and the Anglo-Irish were more Irish than, than the Irish themselves. Um, but it wasn't keen to have um, the Irish take over. So they kept them at bay, kept them at bay for five months, and they were reduced. The population was reduced to eating cats and dogs and rats and horses or whatever they could get their hands on, until eventually, after five months, a ship managed to get up the Boyne and get in and the siege was lifted because Vela Money realised, my God, you know, they're not going to be, they're never going to be flushed out because now they've got supplies and they can uh, last another however many months. Um, and that's huge in this whole scenario because uh, when Cromwell came to town, um, Ormond, this is Lord Ormond, who was a Protestant, he was Cromwell's chief adversary in Ireland and he chose to, and I'm going to quote you from the times of the day, the moderate intelligencer who was, who, this was John Dillingham, his um, publication in London. And uh, he says, uh, this is just as Cromwell was approaching Drogheda, he says that Ormond had cleared Trada, that's Drogheda, of all superfluous and suspected persons and furnished it well with all necessities. Every man in that kingdom fit to bear arms is in a posture of war. Now, what? Hold on. Wait. What are we saying here? So there's two huge pieces of information in that. Firstly, that 
Ormond had cleared the town of all superfluous and suspected persons. So that's gigantic. That's contemporary evidence that mouths that were going to take up precious food were removed from the town. That would clearly mean women, children and men who weren't involved in the conflict. We have no idea how many of them took up, took up or were, were you know, acquiesced to the order. Um, but we have to assume that a very large proportion of them did. We do know, for instance, that uh, Dean Nicholas Bernard, who was the rector at St. Peter's, his wife and family were documented because he says it as, as um, being removed from the town. Um, so there's corroborating evidence straight away. Um, so people who have this idea, A, that the townspeople defended Drogheda is total nonsense because the army within the walls was the royalist army um, placed there by Ormond with, a, with um, uh, English and Irish uh, defenders, Protestants and Catholics. Really nothing to do with the population who lived there. Now, we also know now from the second part of what Ormond has just told us, he says that every man in that kingdom fit to bear arms is in a posture of war. So now we have contemporary evidence that actually says that inhabitants were armed. Inhabitants of Drogheda were armed. Very clear to me. I, I don't understand how this hasn't been uh, out in the public domain. Uh, because it simply means that if you discuss the three words and many inhabitants that Cromwell is alleged to have said he killed, of course he did, because they were at war. They were in arms. And there is the evidence to support that allegation. Um, so they also had uh, stocked the town with nine months of what they called victuals for the soldiers. So it was a big thing in those days, feeding the armies. I mean, up to, up to that point, armies were marauding across the country, Ireland, England, stealing cattle, stealing corn and so on. Um, but Cromwell had money. And Cromwell wanted to make sure that his soldiers paid for goods. Um, and when they were outside the town, people would flock to the army. Uh, this is the country people. These are the sellers and the hawkers and so on. And they would feed the army outside the towns. Um, because how else would they get would they get fed if there were long sieges? Um, anyway, so um, there's there's the, the things that we know about the civilians are there was also that a, a civilian plot within the town to allow, to allow Cromwell in, and again something that's not generally known or generally talked about. A lady Wilmot spearheaded that particular plot. Um, of course, uh, Arthur Aston banned her from the town, sent her out to Melifont when he got wind of that. Um, but again, these are things we know about the civilians. This is not something that that we we you know we're, we're speculating about. It's 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 not. Um, these are facts. And these are the things we know. Um, so anyway, Cromwell and Catholics. We just want to just talk about that for a second. Um, Cromwell, from a very early age, um, was um, uh, educated in a Protestant. Uh, domain he domain he was uh, event, eventually ended up becoming a puritan um and we all know and there's no point in skirting around the subject that um popery um and catholicism was responsible for a, it was basically a cesspit of depravity um over the centuries where the crusades um occurred and muslims and arabs were killed and men women children the poor cathars in france they were killed um, mercilessly if they didn't conform to the to the Catholic faith and that's um, pretty clear and there are so many atrocities that the Catholic faith was responsible for over the years um, that you could actually understand from this distance um, if one was to judge where Cromwell would find his position in this life he didn't believe that you needed to have a hierarchy to get you to God in other words you didn't need uh, a priest, you didn't need a bishop, you didn't need an archbishop, you didn't need a cardinal, you didn't need a pope. All you needed was your relationship with God. Um, and that's what he, that's basically what his entire life was founded on. Um, so this whole idea that the Catholic clergy, and it was the clergy that he had the problem with, and that's very clear from his documents. It wasn't the flock, it was the, sh it was the shepherds that he had the difficulty with. They were the ones who were making the decisions and they would inveigle uh, encourage, um, uh, you know, in 1641, for instance, Cromwell was absolutely convinced that the, the, the priests um, from the pulpit would tell the Catholics in Ireland that an only good Protestant one was a dead Protestant. 
um, and they were well capable of that. And, and, and there's research been done to suggest that, that, it, that it was quite clear that that happened. Um, so when we look back at, 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 at priests from this distance, it's, it's not the same type of, of um, priest, uh, you know, that we would have uh, that we would have had today. A very different animal altogether. Um, so the civil war broke out in, in, in England and we're not going to go into that in too, much, in too much detail. But suffice to say, Cromwell was exceptionally successful in the battles that he fought. Um, despite having no military uh, history whatsoever, he was a farmer and at 43, all he had ever done was farm. Um, but in the battles of um, Naseby and Mar- Marston Moor and Gainsborough and um, lots of other minor battles, Coventry, Preston, um, Cromwell came out um, on top. Uh, whether it was on the battlefield or whether it was sieges, um, Basingstoke concluded, uh, he just happened to win them all. Uh, there's nothing that he didn't that he didn't succeed. So he he came right up through the ranks, um, and eventually, of course, um, this this was all to do with that they had fallen out with their king. Charles was uh, intransigent. Um, he was duplicitous. He was um, very difficult to deal with, and uh, so they chopped off his head in January 1649 and the next thing they had to do was they had to come to Ireland they had to come to Ireland for several reasons firstly there was when the 1641 rebellion broke out um, adventurers had contributed money to the war uh, and in return they would get land uh, when Ireland was eventually subjugated uh, they had to come to uh, quash the, the threat of an Irish army being assembled and being formed to come over to England to, to, to threaten and to challenge the, the, the parliamentarian rule, uh, which was a fledgling uh, government. Um, and, uh, you know, it could easily have happened. Uh, King Charles, Prince Charles, who was who, who the, the Scots had proclaimed King Charles um, as soon as his father was killed, uh, was still uh, around. And, and it could easily have been the case that there could have been an Irish army. So they had to focus on Ireland, and they did. Uh, and Cromwell arrived in Ireland on 15th of August, 1649. And these are the, um, the, this is his mantra that he's going to fight the upcoming war with. He says, as soon as he arrives in Dublin, uh, he already knows about what's going on with the parliamentarian armies and the, and, the, and the other armies, the royalist armies that are in the country. He says, whereas I am informed that on, upon the marching out of the armies heretofore and of parties from garrisons, a liberty had been taken by the soldiery to abuse, rob and pillage and too often to execute cruelties upon the country people, being resolved by the grace of God diligently and strictly to restrain such wickedness for the future. So basically what he's saying is, I'm an honourable guy. I'm going to prevent my soldiers from randomly stealing anything from the country people because I want to engage with the country people so as that um, they will get a fair price for their goods. And he was um, also, throughout his life, um, injustices bothered him a lot. And there's plenty of evidence for that. Um, and his orders, his orders to his soldiers, um, which are also very clear, um, and they are these. He says, I do hereby warn and require all officers and soldiers uh, and others under my command henceforth to forbear all such evil practices as aforesaid and not to do any wrong or violence towards country people or persons whatsoever unless they actually be in arms or office with the enemy and not to meddle with the goods of such without special order. Now that's that's it, that's an order. That's an order from Cromwell to his, order, to his soldiers not to uh, do any wrong to persons whatsoever unless they actually be in arms. Just repeating that. They're the orders. They're very clear. And one can speculate, and people play all the time do. Well, they always say, well, when he got to draw in Wexford, everybody just forgot that and they moved on. No. <laughs> no. Because you need to take all these pieces of evidence, not in isolation, all the ones that, that I'm outlining here and that are available in the world, and, and, and draw your conclusions without... Uh, with a blank canvas, you need to think, you need to, people have baggage and people have an inherent bias about this because they've been taught certain things. But if you take away the baggage and you look at it objectively, there really is only one conclusion you can come to. Now, this is huge as well. This is massive, you know, because if we don't get told this, like the day Cromwell swung his legs out of bed to come to Ireland, the previous day, 
Um, uh, Drogheda was under the control of his party. It was under the control of Parliament. And you might think, well, <laughs> how is that possible? Sure, you know, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Um, but it is possible and it was true. Um, for two years, Parliament were in control of Drogheda. And it was only just on the 10th of July that um, the Royalists uh, attacked the town. Uh, and in a, in a, in a skirmish, uh, Lord Inchiquin led the Royalists. Um, the town was taken. Uh, some of the defenders even changed sides and became Royalists because that happened a lot in those days, um, depending on what was on offer or how they felt at a particular time. Um, but we also know that the regiment of Colonel Michael Jones, who was a parliamentarian, he was, uh, they were in Drogheda during those two years. I'm not sure if it was the full two years, but they were certainly there when it capitulated. So now you have the parliamentarians uh, who were in Drogheda. So they were there for two years. I've just said that. And they were there buying milk, buying bread, uh, drinking in the inns, fraternizing with the local population. Now, that regiment came back with Cromwell. So you have the parliamentarians, Colonel Michael Jones, in Drogheda for two years. Then when Cromwell comes to Dublin, he, the Colonel Michael Jones' regiment joins his regiment, comes to Drogheda. So those same men are now outside the walls of Drogheda, trying to get in. And uh, how likely is it that they're going to massacre indiscriminately the people that they fraternised with for two years? That's just, again, another small nugget of evidence. But it's huge. And people look at me when I say that, go, what do you mean for two years? They, they, they were there. They were. So another fairly significant thing that happened on the way to Drata is that so, two soldiers um, uh, disobeyed Cromwell's orders. The orders I've just outlined, and they stole two hen they stole hens from, a, from a, an old woman. And just to show um, that his, um, uh, to, 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 as an example to the rest, he had them hanged because he wasn't going to tolerate that. Uh, that's just the way the world was. He wasn't going to tolerate anybody who, who um, you know, disobeyed his orders. In Drogheda, a few things happened. Um, we kind of go, go through this reasonably quickly. The massacre is the big thing. Obviously, um, Cromwell led the final assault. That was the successful one where the breach was won at St. Mary's Church in Drogheda. And if he took the church, he figured he could hold that and get the rest of the town piecemeal. Um, but it all happened in one fell swoop where uh, the defence totally capitulated when uh, the resistance ended at the walls and the defenders fled. Now, we know there are about, from the muster walls, there are about two 2,800 to 3,000 soldiers in the town. But at this stage, we lose track of them. We, we know, for instance, that many escaped there's that word many again. We know there are many inhabitants um, who were armed. Uh, we, the, the word many keeps coming up. Uh, the events at St. Peter's Church, for instance, where um, the defenders uh, scaled the steeple and Cromwell had the steeple burnt uh, where he pulled the pews underneath um, and they uh, mostly died. Uh, the events at Millmount where Sir Arthur Aston um, was killed due to no amount of skullduggery where an agreement was reneged upon whether it was Colonel Aston or Oliver Cromwell who did it irrespective of that it was reneged upon and the, the, the military defenders of Millmount were killed and um, that's bad enough I'm not going to defend it why should I there's no point and uh, they were soldiers end of story um, he had, by the Geneva Convention uh, of the day, um, Cromwell had every right to take the lives of every defender in the town because the theory was behind that, uh, the rules of war, was that if a defending, if an attacking army were outside the town walls, any town walls for um, uh, any duration, they would be subject to um, starvation and disease and they would die. So by refusing to surrender... Uh, a defending garrison um, basically, you know, left them to the ravages of nature. And that's why that rule was there. So they were well um, within their rights to kill uh, the defenders of Drogheda. The, the, the difference is that it had never happened in the, in the Civil War. And this is the savagery that, that took place there in a military context. Uh, and the numbers of the defenders who were killed compared to the numbers of the attackers it's very clear that a massacre took place and mostly in cold blood. Then what Cromwell did was he was trying to send a message to the rest of the towns in Ireland to say, this is what will happen if you don't surrender. 
I'm still talking in a military context, by the way, just in case anybody has um, uh, suggested I, I'm not. Um, the other thing that happened was there were soldiers who occupied two of the towers in the curtain wall and they sniped at the, at the attackers, the Cromwellians. And when um, they, they made an agreement and they um, surrendered, um, they were, uh, every tenth one of them um, was, uh, was killed. Um, and that's called, um, they were decimated, every tenth one. And um, the officers that were found uh, were also killed. And there was a priest apparently as well found in that um, uh, situation who pretended that he wasn't a priest and that he was a soldier, but he, as soon as he was, it was discovered that he was a priest, he was killed. There were five priests killed at Drogheda. Uh, and again, I am no way going to defend that because that's exactly what happened. Um, and again, just to, to reiterate Cromwell's opinion of the Catholic clergy, he saw them as fair game. Um, so after that, um, the events, they, they happened. Um, and we just need to just... Uh, 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 analyze uh, how they were reported and how we ended up uh, with this convoluted load of nonsense uh, where civilians uh, are alleged to have been killed. My ancestors, people who lived in my town. Um, oddly, there is no eyewitness detail with the exception of Thomas Wood, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, like Ormond, for instance, who was the, I mentioned um, Cromwell's uh, chief adversary. He wrote letters at the time, never mentioned civilian deaths. Inchiquin, who I also mentioned, never mentioned civilian deaths, he wrote as well. About 30% of the population could write at the time. And you think that somebody would write something to say, you know, that, that, that people, people died who shouldn't have died, um, who weren't in the army. Um, uh, but, you know, funny enough, that that's not the case. Um, before the news of Drogheda falling hit London, the corporation of Drogheda met. And in the corporation records, there are hundreds of names of people who existed and both before and after the siege. So Sir, the officer and the unnamed officer in the army of Sir John Clotworthy, who said not a dozen survived out of the town, was talking through his hat. That's total nonsense. Um, and we'll explain why uh, shortly. Um, so we also know that, that plenty of soldiers escaped. We don't know. We, haven't, we can't put a cap on that. We don't know how many it did. We can speculate. Um, but it's just... Um, it's not easy to do that. And that's why number juggling is totally futile. <laughs> John Morrill number juggles and he's um, absolutely would not me into a cocked hat when it comes to Cromwell's life. But when it comes to this area, I'd just like him to explain exactly why he thinks that, that it's worth number juggling and using the word civilians in that inflammatory, incendiary way um, because it's not helpful. And I believe he's wrong. Um, Dean Bernard, who was the uh, rector at, at St. Peter's, wrote an account of the 1641 siege and 1649 siege, and nowhere does he mention civilian deaths. And this is this would he be his flocks? It doesn't matter that he was a Protestant minister. Um, you know, the, 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 the dividing line in this war was not religious. It was royalist versus parliamentarian, and he was a mad royalist, uh, as it happens, and there would have been lots of people in the town who would have been uh, on his page. Um, there are letters also that, that emerged and they were printed in 1649 in London. And one of them, um, we don't know, it's an non anonymous writer. He says, uh, they made entry into the town near the mount by the church, wherein they found resistance, offered quarter, but it would not be accepted of. So they were forced to fight their way into the town, which they did with great resolution and courage and killed the enemy, the enemy, near 3,000, among which Sir Arthur Aston, their governor, and divers other considerable men, putting all to the sword that were in the streets and in the posture of soldiers, but many whom they found in houses and a quiet and orderly posture they gave quarter to. Now we're still talking in a military context. We haven't gone into any civilian domain. Uh, he mentions the enemy and he talks about soldiers who were saved um, in houses. And the word many is there again, but many whom they found in houses and a quiet and orderly posture they gave quarter to. So you have many inhabitants who were killed, you have many who escaped, and you have many who were found in houses. So there's three different cohorts of, of, of uh, the, the Royalist Army, and yet you have people speculating and number juggling and, and suggesting that civilians, uh, which is a, 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 an inordinate way to, to conclude that civilians that, that were babies, teenagers, pensioners, aunties, uncles, uh, and so on, grannies, granddads were killed. Um, so in the winter, uh, when they took a break, Cromwell winter, uh, wintered at Yahoo, 
And uh, during this time, the Catholic clergy decided that what they wanted to do was they wanted to galvanize the country and generate a proper resistance. And they really needed to do something because Cromwell was winning and they couldn't tolerate this. So um, in order to uh, invoke the ire of um, anybody royalist or anybody Irish and anybody who wanted to fight against Cromwell, they suggested that um, Cromwell was here in Ireland to um, extirpate, that's destroy, the Catholic faith. And he, they say in their pamphlet that they had printed and distributed countrywide that uh, in order to extirpate the Catholic religion that he would have to massacre, destroy or banish everybody in that faith. So they made this outlandish remark and they didn't say anything else, uh, which you would think if civilians had have been killed in any number at all, at, at either Drogheda or Wexford, and this is after the, the incidents of both towns, that this was the opportunity for them to say it. I could leave that hanging there. I could say, even that alone, why would they not say it? These were Cromwell's um, enemies. These were the Catholic faith. These were the prelates who met at Clonmacnoise, and all they had to do was say, and by the way, did you see what he did at Drogheda? Did you hear what he did at Wexford? These civilians were killed en masse. He killed women. He killed children. But they don't say that. But in response to uh, their allegations about him coming to extirpate the Catholic faith, Cromwell um, <laughs> sits down and writes a document that's very long. And if there's any uh, requirement or any desire of anybody out there who wants to see what Cromwell's mindset was like, this is the document to evaluate. He, on 10 occasions in this document, uh, says that civilians were not to be killed, not to be harmed, not even killed. Uh, he uses um, language um, that is, it, it's, in, it's, in, it's incredible to see his, his mind, the way it works. He's absolutely abhorred with what the Catholic faith have done through the years. And he says that so often. He's incensed at the whole suggestion um, that he's there to extirpate the Catholic faith because that's not what he's there for. He defends his position in every context. Um, he also says, and I quote, but well, your words are massacre, destroy and banish. Good now. Give us an instance of one man since my coming into Ireland, not in arms, massacred, destroyed or banished concerning the two first of which justice had not been done or endeavoured to be done. In other words, if I if there were there was somebody massacred or destroyed, I would have punished the perpetrators like he did when he hung the two men who were uh, after stealing the hens from the old woman. So he's incensed. He's saying, why would I include somebody who was in not, uh, not who was not in arms? Uh, OK, so Thomas Wood, we mentioned Thomas Wood's uh, account earlier on. Thomas Wood's account is the great load of nonsense in the world, mainly because it doesn't um, come out into the public domain until 1772, which is 123 years after the events. It wasn't written by his brother either. The title of the, of the memoir is The Life of Anthony A. Wood from the year 1632 to 1672, written by himself. That's not even true. What Anthony A. Wood was, he was an antiquarian and he was in Oxford uh, and he lived all his life there and he, on his deathbed, and uh, bequeathed various manuscripts and documents and memoirs that he had to a Dr. Tanner who who gave them to somebody else. Um, and eventually uh, they put cobbled together a very rambling um, version of Wood's life. And in that rambling version of Wood, this is Anthony Wood, that's where the version uh, Thomas Wood's details come out. Now, if we were in a court of law, um, which is insane and we went back in time and we took Cromwell out and we say okay let's we're going to try you now and we, we introduced this as the eyewitness evidence <laughs> it would be laughed at and by the way your honour this came out 123 years after the events okay seriously it's just insane so uh, that's I, we can easily dispense with Thomas Wood we can easily dispense with the unarmed unnamed officer in the regiment of Sir John Clark Worthy because exactly the same thing happened it was, uh, so the book is allegedly written in 1685, but I'm just quoting now. Uh, it lay dormant until it was discovered and transcribed circa 1750 by Reverend Betta, SJ. Oh, look, a Catholic priest. 
during the copying process for the beta left many blank spaces where the original was imperfect. Edmund Hogan reproduced and published the account in 1873 and he admitted to filling in many of the blanks. So yet again, we have a 19th century influence um, on an account of Cromwell at Drogheda. The 19th century was um, notorious for revisiting um, the mid 17th century. And when all, we were all going to be a nation once again, they wanted some sort of scapegoat and some sort of monster uh, to um, hang their hat on. And Cromwell was discovered. Um, Cromwell wrote 40 documents in total from Ireland and not once is the word Catholic mentioned. It's just not there. It doesn't happen. So again, this is something that might surprise people. The war that he was fighting in every context and everywhere where that he writes was between royalist and parliamentarian. He wasn't necessarily that interested in the in the religious divide. Um, and that's that's a shock to a lot of people. Uh, so when he wrote back his letter uh, to Parliament, uh, the words and many inhabitants appear on a list that's appended to that letter, irrespective of whether he wrote the words or, or who wrote, because somebody did, wrote the words, we now know that inhabitants were armed and many of them may well have been. I have gone to forensic, uh, into forensic detail uh, checking those words and, and trying to find it if Cromwell wrote, wrote them himself. Um, it doesn't really matter, to be honest. I have concluded and proved that the list that, that was appended to his letter um, was written five days before his letter was written. Um, so, and it also is printed in seven different news books uh, at the time or newspapers and only, five, only two of them, you put the words and many inhabitants at the bottom and none of the news books attribute the list to Cromwell. So it's most likely, and again in a court of law, that's kind of conclusive. None of them attribute it to Cromwell. But irrespective of whether Cromwell wrote them or whether he didn't write them, we now know that many inhabitants were armed because the evidence proves that they were. So of the, uh, the news books, uh, the moderate intelligencer, is the one that, that and again, that's the, 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 the Irish Times, the Times of the day, uh, that produces the list on the 22nd of September, and Cromwell's letter wasn't written until, until the 27th. Um, so Mercurius Electricus, which we mentioned earlier, and it was printed and published by a guy called George Wharton. Mercurius Electricus uh, says, just to remind you that he says that the, the roundheads possessed themselves of the town and used all cruelties imaginable on the besieged as well <coughs> inhabitants and others sparing neither women nor children. So uh, that's by George Wharton and George Wharton was a royalist hack. He was just basically somebody who uh, he was a polemicist, a propagandist. Uh, he um, he um, basically used to go to a pub and invent all kinds of stories about how they would uh, um, castigate, denigrate, um, make Parliament look bad in any way, shape, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, Jason McGilligot, who studied the print media in the 17th century, says of Wharton that Birkenhead, Taylor and Wharton met once a week in a tavern in Oxford to muster up whole regiments of lies, slanders and ridiculous quibbles against the Parliament and the city of London. So that's George Wharton, whose reputation isn't exactly impeccable. Uh, and he, uh, in, in October, never visited Rada. I mean, I put my money on it. I don't know, I can't go back in a time machine, but he doesn't say he was there. And why would he be? He's just a journalist. Um, uh, so John Crouch printed The Man in the Moon. And The Man in the Moon, again, we mentioned it earlier on, he said that 2,000 were women and children who were, uh, who were killed. McGilligot says about Crouch is that uh, the eight-page weekly was printed by John's kinsman, Edward Crouch. It recounted little news and relied instead on obscene stories and rhymes to fill its pages. Its principal targets were Parliament, the Army and the Council of State. And again, we're talking about the reputation of, of guys who could just do what they wanted. Um, but the key part of all of this is that, that what we're saying is that, that 
despite the fact that loads of people could write, loads of people were, were articulate, were depending on two royalist hacks who, who suggest, and who were the first to suggest, that Cromwell kill civilians. But there's no, <laughs> there's no evidence elsewhere. And when we take their um, assertions into context, you realise that uh, they have to be nonsense because that's October 1649. And let's say November 1649 came along, nobody wrote anything about civilian deaths. December 1649, nope, not a word. Uh, let's say 1650. No, 1651, no, 52, no, all the way up to 1660. Nobody writes anything about civilian deaths apart from those two guys. Now, if anybody else has found something out there that is lying on the dusty shelves of obscurity that proves me wrong, please present it. Because we're now 11 years after the events and no allegations of civilian deaths have been made by a contemporary writer. Of course, when Cromwell's Republic fails and when Charles II puts his royal seat back on the throne, it's open season on Cromwell and the Republic, the Interregnum, and they can say what they bloody like because they won eventually. The previous 19 years of war was wiped out. The king was back on the throne and the Republic was ripped up and torn apart. And that's when the allegations some allegations of civilian deaths start to come into play. And that's a huge factor in this. It's massive because the winners basically write history. Even James Heath, who wrote in 1663, three years after the Restoration, he doesn't, he's Cromwell's worst um, a, a opponent. He says so many things about Cromwell. He suggests that he killed 300 women around a cross at, at, at Wexford, which is total nonsense. Um, but we're not going to deal with that today. Uh, but he doesn't even say that Cromwell killed, uh, that, that, that defenceless um, men, women and children were killed at Drogheda. So it starts to filter through after that. And of course, as the centuries go on, um, it, 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 it gains traction, but mostly gains traction in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century, when we're looking for, as I mentioned earlier, we're looking for somebody to blame for all of Ireland's woes. And Cromwell fitted the bill perfectly because he won um, despite in the end him his his republic failing, he bet us and Charles II effectively accepted the Cromwellian plantation um, that that uh, was was in place after they left. Um, the Court of Claims in the 1660s uh, was uh, was documented. Uh, it documented a lot of the land ownership um, changes and the transformation of the landscape. Uh, during that um, plantation. Um, and in that, um, Mihola Shukru pointed out that uh, two civilians in Drogheda, and the names of them, and we have them, uh, one of them is a guy called uh, Mortimer, and another is a guy called Fleming. And we know that they died because their names are in the Court of Claims as having died during 1649. What we don't know is that they were armed. One of them was 70 years of age, um, but it's quite possible that he could have been armed. He could have had a heart attack. He could have um, anything could have happened. He could have just gotten in the in the way of a cannonball. But what we don't know is that he was deliberately killed, um, or uh, anything about it. We just it's just too ambiguous. Again, we can't make that leap. We can't extrapolate two names, Fleming and Mortimer. We can't extrapolate those to justify um, significant numbers of civilians being killed at Drogheda. We do know, and I'm absolutely saying this, that civilians died at Drogheda. The only thing is, we just happen to know two of them. Anything else is, well, we also have the and many inhabitants line. So we do know that inhabitants, most likely who weren't in the army or soldiers, they died. Um, so that's pretty clear. But what we don't know is that, like I said before, the non-military ordinary people of Drogheda were killed at all because that's not what the evidence is telling us. And what really disappoints me again is, and I'm just going to emphasise it one more time, is the juggling, uh, the number of juggling, juggling of the of the historians like Mara, like Ashoka and like McElligot, uh, because it's completely wrong. Uh, this, this whole thing, of course, fits in with, with Cromwell as being fundamentally honourable. And as I said earlier on, uh, a reasonably good man 
Um, and I am Irish, just so that um, everybody knows this. But it has to be understood. The context is everything. You can't just cherry pick and go, of course, Cromwell was it was it was a bee because it's the same as saying Hitler or Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein. You know, that's just um, inflammatory nonsense. Uh, he was a tender father. He hated injustices. He was a, uh, an encourager of religious toleration. Um, his policy all through the protectorate was to encourage um, to various religions, Anabaptists, Quakers. He, he allowed the Jews back into into England after a few hundred years. I think 1290 was the last time they were there, but that was to do with commerce as well as as, as religion because he thought that the second coming would come if they were if they were back. He was abhorred by massacres that, that, that the Catholics had uh, perpetrated on the Piedmontese um, by the Duke of Savoy when he heard about them. Uh, and this wasn't double standards. This was just basically him. He didn't return to... Uh, you know the good old Cromwell that he was when he left England uh, after coming back from Ireland he was always the same and he was always the same here so basically to sum up there was no motive for the soldiers in Cromwell's army to kill any of the townspeople in Drogheda because <laughs> uh, they had no orders to do that they also um, uh, w wouldn't have been inclined to uh, because they might have been killed and might have been hung by Cromwell, who knows what his justice, his means of justice would be. Um, and of course, there's no evidence. Um, again, if the evidence is there, um, please present it. Um, you know, I'm I'm not talking about the subsequent Cromwellian plantation because that's a very different animal. Uh, I'm simply talking about a very specific uh, situation where did civilians? I'm really fed up saying the word civilians. Now, did they die? Um, uh, indiscriminately where my ancestors killed and well, if they were how did I end up here um, and uh, or not because that's the key everything else about the Cromwell in Ireland is is um, open season and you can discuss it if you like I'm just going to finish on uh, an interesting um, school of thought that is, is coming down the line and it's also revisionism and there's a, there's a, um, a historian an eminent historian by the name of John Cunningham, who is also Irish, and he says, and I just think this is interesting, um, because it's all to do with context, he says that while the massacre at Drogheda in 1649 remains a blot on his reputation, in the 1650s, Cromwell, in fact, emerged as an important and effective ally for Irish landowners seeking to defeat the punitive confiscation and transplantation policies approved by the Westminster Parliament and favoured by the Dublin government. What? <laughs> Did you get that? Cromwell, in fact, emerged as an, an important and effective ally for Irish landowners. Um, in his extensive dealings with Irish landowners, he displayed a genuine compassion for cases of hardship and a strong aversion to perceived unfairness and injustice. Moreover, it is clear that the Catholics and Protestants who made approaches to Cromwell fully expected to be treated equitably and honourably by him, and nothing that had occurred during the conquest of Ireland was sufficient to dampen their expectations. If you're still here and you've lasted all this time, yes, I don't have um, a, a, a huge amount to say about the Cromwellian plantation, except to say that the word Cromwell shouldn't really be in there. It was others. As John Morrell said, um, we tend to blame Cromwell for all our woes and we let those really responsible off the hook and that's wrong. Um, Henry Ireton, Charles Fleetwood, Edmund Ludlow, all these names of, of people who were, who were in the Irish Parliament um, and who, you know, Cromwell always um, disagreed with his parliaments um, all the way through his protectorate. Again, that's context. Um, he could never get one to... to uh, agree fully with um, throughout that time when he ruled from 1653 to 1658. I'm practically done now. I want to thank you for listening and watching. If you're if you're um, still here at the at the end of this, and uh, just to sort of reiterate that between the years 1649 and 1660, nothing was said about Cromwell uh, civilian deaths. And um, that's huge. There are lots of other bits and pieces in there, but the two years that, that Parliament were occupied the town, no eyewitness attestation. 
I am available <laughs> for bar mitzvahs, um, guest teas, weddings. Um, I'm available to talk in all seriousness um, anywhere about this. Um, I, I'm challenging convention mainly because I'm a cynic. I'm very passionate and love my country, love my town. But uh, I can't be doing with the injustice. And I, I don't believe that we should continue into the future uh, castigating Cromwell as a genocidal maniac because effectively he wasn't. Thank you very much for listening. I'm going to switch off right now. Goodbye.